On February 27, 2006, the mother of the 14-year-old Zhao Long was getting increasingly concerned that her son had not returned home after going out the previous day. She had been calling friends and family to find out if anyone had seen the boy. Her worry was made worse by the rumor going round the town that child traffickers had been kidnapping children in the area, as a number had gone missing over the past few months. When an unfamiliar man brought her son home she was relieved and thankful. Apart from a small cut on the bridge of his nose her son looked fine. She told the boy to go inside and turned back to the man. He looked a little surprised to see her and turned to leave. Before walking away the man said, the boy is sick. Don't listen to what he says. Her relief turned to horror when her son told her what happened to him the night before. Zhao Long had been in the local internet cafe playing games until his money ran out. An older man who was a regular there and who was known as Big Button approached him. Big Button told him he had a games console at home and they could go there to keep playing. The boy agreed and went to the man's home. Once inside, Zhao Long could smell something terrible, and the previously friendly Big Button was now holding a knife to his face. Big Button lifted a sheet on the bed to reveal four rotting corpses of children. The man told Zhao Long he would join them if he didn't do as he was told. Terrified, Zhao Long obeyed and was assaulted on the bed next to the corpses. He was so close he could see they had been disemboweled. When he was finished, Big Button held Zhao Long tight and began to tell him about his tragic life, even breaking down into tears as he spoke. Looking at the corpses on the bed, Zhao Long knew he would be joining them. He tried to think of a way to escape. He knew if he could get outside to a crowded place he would be safe. The next morning once Big Button woke up, Zhao Long told him he was cold and wanted to go home. He told Big Button that both his parents were away on business trips so the house was empty. Big Button asked if there was any money in his home, to which Zhao Long said he didn't know but the older man could look for some. When Zhao Long finished telling his story the family would go to the police. The search began for Big Button. Zhao Long managed to direct them to the home where the bodies were being kept but there was no sign of Big Button. They asked the landlord of the building who was renting the room. The landlord gave them the name, Gong Runbo. Born in 1973, Gong Runbo grew up in the city of Jiangsu in China's most northeastern province of Heilongjiang. Jiangsu is in the most eastern part of the province, close to bordering Russia. As such it has cold harsh winters and fairly mild summers. Gong Runbo was fairly fortunate that both his parents were working for a state-owned enterprise when he was born. It didn't mean they weren't poor but it was a step up from being a farmer. It also meant that the young Gong Runbo would be educated at the company's school. It gave the family a more comfortable life than many in China during this period. However, not showing much promise in education he dropped out after middle school and began an apprenticeship in the company's workshop, casting parts for tractors. He suffered a work-related injury at this time and the bosses felt he was too young, only 16, to do this work. He was transferred to another workshop producing tools. At the time his colleagues thought of him as a hard worker, but a little reserved and someone who liked to work alone. After a two-year apprenticeship he became a qualified late worker, but there were about to be big changes in the life of his parents. In the 90s many state-owned enterprises were being privatized. The company that housed an employee Gong Runbo and his parents was struggling and had to lay off a large number of employees. This plunged the family into poverty, they struggled to find any work at all. Gong Runbo would help his mother go around the city looking for plastic bottles to get the recycling fee, while his father tried selling food and drinks on the streets. By now Gong Runbo was almost 20 so it was felt it was time for him to marry. He had a girlfriend in the factory community but any idea of marriage was strongly opposed by the girl's mother. Instead his parents tried to arrange a marriage for him with a woman from rural area of the county. The woman's family didn't mind Gong Runbo not having steady work and it seemed as if the two would be wed. But tragedy hit, the father of Gong Runbo died suddenly of a cerebral hemorrhage. The planned wedding was called off. It would be some time after this Gong Runbo would find a new girlfriend of his own that he met at a skating rink. The two would cohabit together at times, something that was a little unusual for non-married couples at that time in China. The relationship would however be brought to a swift end when the parents of the girl confronted Gong Runbo in the streets one day. The girl was only 13 years old, while Gong Runbo was 23. Being 13, the girl was under the age of consent in China and her parents went to the police. Gong Runbo was arrested and convicted for R-word, 
His awful attempt at a defense of his actions was that he thought the girl was at least 14. He was sentenced to eight years in prison. When the sentence was given, Gong Runbo was said to have reacted with surprise. His mother later said to him he was lucky. If he had done this a decade earlier, the punishment would have been much worse. Gong Runbo did not fare well in the prison environment. With him being quite skinny, having a withdrawn personality combined with his crime, he was easy prey for other prisoners. He was gang awarded by several of the men in his cell. While in the prison hospital recovering from the attack, he slit his own wrists to end his life. When he was saved, it seemed that his personality saw a significant change. He joined with other prison bullies and began going after weaker prisoners, doing to others what he had been through. His mother would continue to face hardships. Her youngest son would get sent to a different prison for robbery. Struggling with her health, she had to regularly travel to two different jails to visit her sons. Eventually, she moved from the city, found a new man whom she would marry. The skills Gong Runbo learned during his apprenticeship in the factory finally came into use. They gave him the opportunity to reduce his sentence by nine months using his ability with a leg in the prison, which doubled up as a factory. He was released from prison in 2003. After his release, he was supposed to go to the police station where his household was registered and inform them of who he was, but this was a step he ignored. Gong Runbo went back to his mother and moved into his new stepfather's home. His stepfather already had a son who was 10 years older than Gong Runbo. Both the stepfather and his son were wary of Gong Runbo since they knew he had been in prison and what he did to get sent there. His new stepbrother, Huang Qing, said later he didn't speak much to the reserved Gong Runbo and that they never spoke about what Gong Runbo experienced in prison. Huang Qing worked for his father's construction company. He stated his father hated his new stepson because he was lazy and clumsy when it came to work. Gong Runbo earned money at this time by selling lamb kebabs on the street and helping out doing odd jobs in a small food shop. He then used what little money he could scrape together from his savings and what he could borrow to open a barbecue restaurant. It saw little business and Gong Runbo closed it after he was attacked and badly beaten by angry locals. It is unconfirmed but it is believed he was attacked because people found out why he went to prison. After being released from hospital he asked his mother for money to rent a small rundown room in a cheap part of the city. It isn't known what he did for money but he spent most of his time at internet cafes playing computer games and surfing the internet. His main haunt and the place that would become his hunting ground was the Tianqi Internet Cafe. With his dream of having a successful business gone and the idea of being able to marry and have a good life a distant fantasy, Gong Runbo gave up on trying. Now in his 30s and the belief he was never going to find a girlfriend or wife, and having ever-growing sexual impulses he started turning his attention to what was around him to satisfy his desires. His experience in prison had taught him how he could get what he wanted. His time preying on weaker inmates by using things they needed to get sex was something he could put into practice in the internet cafe. All around him there were young children, mostly boys, weak, vulnerable, and easy to manipulate. Over time Gong Runbo became a familiar sight at the Tianqi Internet Cafe. Not especially imposing, balding, and in his 30s he would be referred to by the regulars as Big Bud. He spent so much time there the boss would pay him to do odd jobs around the place. In February of 2005 Gong Runbo committed his first crime since being released from prison. He managed to convince a 12-year-old boy to go with him to his home. He awarded the boy a number of times before letting him go. The next incident happened a month later. Gong Runbo was seen hugging a 10-year-old girl in the street. Fortunately for the girl, her father saw this and attacked and took Gong Runbo to the police station and reported it. When the father went back to the police a few days later to see what was being done about the men, the police seemed disinterested about the matter and happy to ignore it. He followed this by getting a 13-year-old boy to go home with him, once again from the internet cafe. He awarded the boy multiple times but as with the previous boy he allowed him to leave alive. He had threatened both boys not to tell anyone or he would come for them. He was gaining in confidence because the police hadn't knocked on his door. Despite going after boys Gong Runbo didn't see himself as homosexual. He had assaulted the boys simply to satisfy his lust and they were easy to find in the internet cafe. What he really wanted was a girl. In March of 2005 he would get one. He spotted a 9-year-old girl going home from school. Gong Runbo pretended to be sick and asked her to help him get home. The young girl did as she was asked. 
Once inside the home, she was assaulted. Given the punishment he received for having sex with an underage girl in the past, Gong Runbo didn't want to take the chance of it happening again. He killed the girl with a hammer and dismembered her body before burning it. Over the next month, he would get rid on the remains in various locations, usually public toilets, around the city. With their nine-year-old daughter and granddaughter missing, the family of the young girl were not happy by the efforts being made by the police. The family pressured them into doing more. Although this was denied by the police, there are several reports of them taking out sniffer dogs to find traces of the young girl. It was said the dogs took police into the garden of the home of Gong Runbo. At that time, the landlord was making rice wine in the yard area and got into an argument about what the police were doing there. The landlord believed the police were just looking to make trouble for him. The police left without searching the area. The reports of a missing girl were printed in the local paper. This caused Gong Runbo to lay low for six months. It wouldn't be until October that he struck again. He found a 14-year-old boy who was living on the streets. Gong Runbo told the boy he could come and stay with him. The chance of getting out of a cold Heilongjiang winter was something the young boy couldn't turn down. This time the abuse would go on for a month until Gong Runbo grew bored of the boy. Gong Runbo strangled his victim before dismembering the body. He placed the remains in buckets and filled them with cement. He cut the buckets in his home. Once again, Gong Runbo waited for the police to come, but once again, no one came. The frequency of his crimes would start to gather pace. Only the next month, he took his next victim. It was a 12-year-old boy from the internet cafe. This time, the boy's hell would last 10 days before. Once again, Gong Runbo grew bored. He killed the boy, but this time didn't go through the hassle of disposing of the body. He simply left it in the room to rot. He even sent a letter to the boy's mother. It was an apparent attempt to get a ransom off the boy's family. However, Gong Runbo had grown too lazy to go through with his plan. He didn't even attempt to get any money off the family after forcing the boy to write the letter. The next victim would be taken in December. A 10-year-old boy. Gong Runbo decided to focus on boys as he felt people didn't care as much when they went missing. He abused the boy while the body of his previous victim was rotting next to them on the bed. After killing the boy, he mutilated the remains. As with the previous victim, he didn't go to the trouble of disposing of the body. He left it to rot on his bed with the other victim. By now at the internet cafe, the regulars had noticed a strange odor coming from the old man, Big Button. Gong Runbo then took two boys in the space of a week, both from the Tianqi internet cafe. The first a boy of 16 on New Year's Eve was followed by a boy of 10 on January 7th. Like the other victims, they were abused, killed, and mutilated after death. Their bodies left to rot on the bed. A family member of one of the victims would receive strange phone calls after the boy had gone missing. The person wasn't aware at the time he took the call that his young cousin was missing. He would only find out after calling the rest of the family. After receiving the phone calls, the family reported the boy missing to the police. In fact, all families of the victims had reported them missing. The only victim that wasn't was the young homeless boy, who likely had run away from his family long ago. Despite this, there was little action taken. Gong Runbo had been right to think the police weren't overly concerned about young boys going missing compared to young girls. The police felt it was boys being boys. They were teens who had run away to have some fun or after a family quarrel, and they would turn up soon enough. Still, the families didn't want to imagine the horrors happening under their noses. They instead chose to believe a gang of traffickers were in the area, kidnapping the children. In despair, the families produced their own missing posters and plastered them around the city. They would also look to the local media to help, if the police weren't willing to do anything they needed to do it themselves. It wouldn't be until Zhao Long escaped with his life that Gong Runbo would be exposed and caught. Even though there were later suggestions that police were prepared to ignore the report of Zhao Long, not wanting to believe something as horrific as this could happen, they would go to the room rented by Gong Runbo and find the bodies on the bed. As they conducted their search, they discovered how truly horrific the situation was. The victims found on the bed had all suffered various mutilations, eyes, ears or noses had been removed. All had their internal organs taken out. Some of the organs were found decomposing in a bucket, others placed into plastic bags and left on the floor of the room. 
The police would also find a large amount of children's clothing in the room and in some reports up to 28 pairs of children's shoes. The next step was to find Gong Renbo. The police didn't have to look too hard. After taking Zhao Long to his home and seeing his family was there, Gong Renbo expected to be reported to the police. He knew he couldn't go back to his apartment so he went to the place that was his second home. The Tianqi Internet Cafe. The police found him there, seemingly just waiting for them to come and get him. After his arrest he confessed to the murder of six children and the molestation of eleven. All victims were children from the local area. While he openly told the truth about his crimes, he also would tell interrogators bizarre lies about his life. He would tell investigators about his successful education, his time in college and his graduation, something which never happened. This is something he did with Zhao Long as they lay together on a bed next to rotting corpses. He told the young boy about a wife that left him and his own child who he couldn't see anymore. Again things which were pure fantasy. He also went into detail about how he took control of the children. Once in his home he would slap them hard twice and put a knife to their faces. Once he got too lazy to dispose of the bodies he would use them to further intimidate the children as he had with Zhao Long. He would also order his victims to call him daddy or godfather. Knowing what his fate would be at his trial he only had two requests. One was that they hurry up and execute him. The other was that people didn't trouble his mother. He wanted her left alone. The last time he saw her was to borrow 100 RMB, she would complain about him taking her pension. When visiting her he went wearing a coat that belonged to one of his victims. In July 2006 Gong Runbo was sentenced to death and ordered to pay the families of his victims' compensation. He refused to appeal the verdict, at the sentencing he did offer his apologies to the families of the victims, but they were not welcome. He was executed on New Year's Eve the same year. The families of the victims rightfully didn't attempt to hide their anger. Many would let loose on the police in interviews with the media, but their words were often not reported. One family questioned the landlord who lived in the room above the place at least six children were killed. They wanted to know how he didn't hear what was going on in the room below. Several families would move out of the city completely wanting to get away from the feeling Jiamusi city gave them. The Tianqi Internet Cafe remained open, but when a reporter visiting the city spoke to some kids smoking outside it, he asked if they knew about what happened there. Naturally they knew Big Button. One of them saying he asked me to go with him one time, offered to buy me some snacks, but I didn't dare go. As often happens with cases such as this urban legends have grown, making the killer seem more than he was. People claim he may have killed up to 28 times, but given he only abducted children from a very small area and only 6 children going missing had been noticed that figure seems fanciful. Also some media reports outside China claim that, when he was arrested he was naked in the room riding a rocking horse made out of the bones of his victims. Given that this was a killer too lazy to dispose of four victims and slept next to their rotting corpses, it is ridiculous to believe he would have made so much effort. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video please consider like, subscribing, and commenting. And we hope to see you again for the next one.